Hi everybody, welcome back. Well, I have a few minutes here to get started on another video uh, before I have some more things to go out and do for work and so forth. And uh, on our last video series, I, I released three videos all at the same time. And it was a series where we were trying to do a little bit of back to basics work using a minimal amount of test equipment and doing some simple things like that. This video we're going to do a little different. Uh, the previous one was real basic. I think this one I'm going to skip over the basic things and I'm only going to show some of the more advanced uh, things when we're working on this. This is a Pioneer model SX980. Uh, a uh, good friend of mine brought it in. We're going to go over it. And this is a really good example of something that's a little bit of a step up from the base model receivers. It has some really nice features on it. it uh, I believe this one incorporates those ring emitter transistors that are supposed to be high speed. We'll get into that later. But this should be a really good project. I've done quite a few uh, of this kind of thing. I've only done one or two other 80 series though. And they are a little bit different than the 50 series Pioneers. So that should be kind of interesting. If that sounds interesting to you, that's what we're going to do in this video. Again, I'm not going to show a lot of the things like, you know, cleaning stuff and recapping things. And, you know, you've seen that a million times on all my videos. I know some of you will be disappointed because you kind of enjoy uh, when I chat as well. I'm doing some of that. We'll maybe get a little bit of that in there, but... For the most part, I'm going to kind of jump to the parts where we use some of the test equipment and do some of the more um, advanced types of testing and things like that. It's a little more than, than what we did on the last series. So if that sounds good to you, stay tuned. That's what we're going to be doing. You know, everything I seem to get, and I don't know if it's just me or what, but this is, this is what I would call a clean unit for my bench. And look at that. It looks like Nosferatu was living in there or something. And uh, I don't know. So with all that said, I'm going to do my regular ritual and clean this all up. Uh, the good news is about this one is it doesn't have rust. It doesn't have mouse urine. It doesn't have anything like that on it. So it's really just crud. And you know it. If all that I said before isn't bad enough, then you got these YouTube channels where they put the dirt on a perfectly good stereo so that they can shoot a video of them cleaning it back off. That to me is asking, I don't know, you're a glutton for punishment if you like that. Why would anybody want to have to do this? This is cruddy. Okay, so I got this thing cleaned up did the obligatory, power it up on the dim bulb, check the power supplies, power's all good, check the uh, speaker terminals for DC offset, offset was perfect. On one channel it was only about 2 milliamps, the other channel it was around 11 milliamp, millivolts, I'm sorry, <laughs> 2 millivolts on one channel, 11 millivolts on the other, connected a set of speakers, dead silent, which is good, uh, the protect relay comes in after the five seconds or whatever when you turn it on. Everything's looking good. Uh, put a little bit of music on. Okay, so there's no music right now. I have no signal feeding into the amplifier. So, of course, uh, we turn up the volume and nothing. I'm not even hearing any hiss, which is very strange. But what I am hearing as I turn the volume up, let me back you up here so you can see what I'm doing. It's hard to get this whole thing in the camera because it's just so, such a big unit. But remember, no signal where we have auxiliary selected. I'm going to take the microphone and put it right in front of the protect relay. Here's the protect relay. Watch as I turn the volume up and this is just silence. you hear that? So there you go. It 
shut off just by turning the volume up with no signal whatsoever. And strangely enough, I am hearing absolutely no sound whatsoever. Well, actually I had the speakers turned off. So here's speaker A turned on. I still don't hear anything. No hiss, nothing. Nothing. Now here's the other thing. If I put some music on, so now I have a song, and let's look at the power meters to see if they deflect when we put some sound on. Okay, now let's turn the volume up, and as soon as I go to the very first click, the very first, I mean right here, and you notice there was nothing on there, right? I'm going to put the microphone next to the to the relay again. Did you see that? I got a tiny little bit of sound for about a split second and then the protect relay kicked in. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of aim this over to the speakers. It's so quiet I don't know if you're going to hear this, but... Wrong speaker. There's nothing in the left speaker. And there's a tiny little bit of very distorted sound in the right speaker. So there's something going on in this amp, and I don't know what it is. We're going to have to find out. Okay, we were doing some voltage checks here on the amplifier modules. I checked the power supply out just statically, you know, quick check. It looks like the voltages are all there, and they look like they should be right. I didn't consult the manual yet. I then went to look at the voltages across the output transistors of both channels. This channel looked good. This one here, this transistor, looked like it was having a problem. The voltage was incorrect. And lo and behold, when I went in there to look, I noticed this. Let me move this out of the way. Look at that. Just dangling like a participle. There it is. That belongs down in here. I don't even know how it broke off like that, but there it is. So we will definitely have to reattach that before we go any further, huh? Okay, we have the resistor connected, and strangely enough, when I put this on there, when I went to clean the solder pad off, there was no broken off piece in, of the lead in there. So I don't know if that lead pulled up out of there from the factory or what, but that was kind of strange. Everything seems to be okay now. Turned it on. I have some music playing, but we have some really strange things going on here. Let me turn the volume up and I'll hold this microphone near the speakers. Here it is, I turn it up and down. And of course the song ends. Let me get another song here. Uh, just something. It sounds really bad. I mean, yeah, the song's not that great either, but... All right, let me get you on the control so you can see what I'm doing when it makes these noises, okay? Here's the volume control, and here, I'm just going to turn it up one click. See, turn, turning it up and down. So there is something really going on with this volume control. And if I use the balance, right channel doesn't sound too bad, left channel is dead. And then if I rotate the volume, yeah. So there's obviously another problem, and what it looks like to me, first, kind of just the first look, is we need to clean some controls. 
but we have a problem with this volume knob and I don't know if this is one of those stepped attenuators I can't tell yet um, or if it's an actual just volume pot with detents on it but we're definitely gonna have to see what's wrong with that what's more it sounds like there is voltage on the pot in other words watch again when I turn this up and down it has like a weird click to it let me start the song again now it's gone all together so yeah I think there's something going on here now the other thing this could be let's turn the power off is not only could it be that the pot itself is bad it also could be that there is DC leaking onto the pot in other words there should be a capacitor decoupling any kind of a DC component uh, from the next stage which is where this volume is and again I'm, I'm speculating this because I have not looked at the schematics yet but when you hear like a weird voltage kind of a squeaking snapping sound as you begin to turn the volume up a little bit it can be a bad pot but it can also be a sign that you have a shorted or leaking capacitor and yes that can happen on solid state equipment just the same as it can on vacuum tube equipment uh, this is a direct coupled amplifier but the direct coupled is the amplifier section and not uh, necessarily in the flat amplifier section now the next test we're going to do is I'm going to eliminate the whole front end of this amp by well let me turn the amp around and I'll show you okay a lot of the higher end receivers out there not just Pioneer but everybody has the ability to separate the power amplifier section from the preamp section just by either moving a switch or in this case removing some jumpers and there are even some that have switched connectors when you plug in an RCA plug it makes a little it breaks a little switch inside there and breaks the connection between these so now what we can do is we can take our source from uh, from our buffer amplifier which has a volume control on it by the way and I can plug directly into the power amp and we can eliminate the possibility that there is something wrong with the power amp section once we know that's good we can then go to the preamp section and troubleshoot the problem okay we are connected directly out of the buffer amplifier I have the volume turned all the way down uh, if you don't know what this is go back to my video that I did on it and you can check it out I have a song queued up that is YouTube safe we're going to look at the power meters and again we're driving straight into the power amplifier let's turn the volume up here and let's start a song Well, I would say the amplifier has nothing wrong with it. It sounds beautiful. So our problem is definitely, as I suspected, in the front end here. And we're going to have to now decide what it is, uh, what the problem is. So let's start that. Okay, I think we have a bad volume pot. So this is the good element. And you can see if I turn it down and up, it moves well at least with the with the detents it moves pretty smoothly and you can see all the way up to 50k which is where it is if I move over to the other element and I do the same thing so far so good but now see how it's jumping goes up in resistance then down And see as I move it it gets worse and worse right there there's a bad spot right there 
See it? I'm not even turning it now, I'm just moving it. So there, there's a really bad spot. See, just wiggling it. So, bad pot. So we're gonna have to remove that and clean it. Okay, I got the potentiometer all apart. And the good news is it hasn't been sprayed with anything. This has not been messed with, but you can see how cruddy it is. And that's really what the problem is. And we have some tarnish on these little brushes. See how it's like discolored? It should be a shiny silver color. And then this is the friction grease that they put in these. And there is some on the shaft as well. And it's it has now become almost like honey. It's real sticky and kind of gross. So we are going to clean that and uh, see if we can reconstitute it with something. I don't know that I want to totally remove it because it is supposed to have that tackiness to it. But I think it is starting to dry out a little bit, but that's eh, not too bad. So we're not going to remove that. We're just going to maybe put just a drop of alcohol in there or some uh, mineral spirits, just a drop, I mean a tiny drop to reconstitute a little bit and then see what happens. And then these we're going to clean off and you've seen videos, I've done videos on that. I'm not going to do videos in this series on cleaning pots, like I said. All right, this pot cleaned up perfectly. It's going to be just like new. The grease was still good. I was able to use the excess grease in here to, to relubricate everything. And this is the reason you don't just spray these things. We were able to clean this properly and then put some new uh, insulating grease on the, well, I shouldn't say insulating grease, but uh, contact grease for pots on here and basically renew this thing. It's going to go for another 30 years now like that. Had it been all sprayed and the carbon been messed up, then there would have been a big problem. And uh, the good news is, if we measure both of these, it should be somewhere around 90 or 100K, I think is what this one was. But let's, uh, let's connect there. You should be able to see it. So if we go between these two elements here, 93K, that's good. And this side is 96. It's a wee little bit more. And again, you're going to see that. These pots are not perfect, but they're very close. And they track pretty, pretty close to one another as well. So I think this is going to work. And just a little tip here. This piece right here, you notice this goes around. This is not, does not come in contact with the wiper. This is a direct connection to the center of the pot. And its purpose is the, this is the loudness contour tap that we talk about all the time. So as the pot goes around there, you can see this is where it hits the loudness tap here. And then it, it connects through this. And that's why you have a four pin connection here. So this does work like a stepped attenuator, believe it or not. If you look at these little, little wedge shaped contacts here. You see there's one here, one here, one here, all the way around. Each one of those is a contact and it is painted with this carbon material that goes around here. So from here to here is a measurement of the carbon. So if you've never seen one of these, um, I kind of call it a poor man's stepped attenuator. It doesn't, it's not actual switches with uh, attenuation points, but rather one carbon track with individual little contacts every so often. So if you look from here to here, there's 14K, then 27K, 38K, and you can see and so forth. And if you notice the thickness of the carbon in between there, I don't know if we can get it at a good enough angle, but if you notice there are different thicknesses and that's because of the logarithmic taper of this pot. 
So that's how these things are made. Very interesting. Okay, let's test this thing out and see if it works. All right, that's off, or that's all the way down. And you can see the logarithmic taper. Okay, let's go back and see what this side looks like now. Very good. Nice. It's all fixed. I think we're ready to put this one back in and uh, try it out again. Okay, the pot is mounted back in. All the capacitors have been replaced and two of the 2SA726s that were in there, and we talked about those in the last video series, I replaced those. And here's a good example of what I was talking about in that video. Notice these have little blue dots on them. And this is a uh, marking that uh, tells you the gain range. And these ones always test somewhere in the 300 to 400 beta range, or the HFE, however you want to word it. Some of them have dots on them, some of them do not. Some of them will actually have a little, uh, a little mark on them somewhere. Uh, like a letter that's an insignia, an insignia, but these are closely gain matched when you see these dots. And the dots do represent a gain range. And I know on these 726s, the blue is always somewhere in that 300 to 400 range, but I don't know all the other color codes. Uh, I one time did have a little document that had a cheat sheet of those color dots from Japan, but I do not know what happened to it and I could not find it anywhere on the computer. And I searched a little bit online a while back to find it again and I couldn't find it. But anyway, there we go. I'm going to put this back together. All the controls are cleaned. Everything's ready to go and we're going to be ready to give this thing another test and see if we fix the problem. Okay, I have the board back in and I have everything back together. I have the unit turned on and I've connected up the auxiliary once again and let's see what we get. Let me start up some music, turn the volume up a little bit. Very good. All right. I think we've repaired it. So what all have we done so far? Well, first thing we did was we found that broken lead on the resistor up here, which we connected. And again, I had to strip the, the uh, spaghetti tubing back a little bit to put in there. So it would seem that it broke off, but it didn't. Um, when I removed the solder from the back of the board, there was no lead stuck in the hole there. So I don't know, that's something that was loose from the factory or something that popped out or something. It probably wasn't pushed down in there very well and just barely touching and it just pulled out. So that's fixed. We did the service on the potentiometer, recapped the board and cleaned everything up, replaced those uh, 2S a 726s with KSA 922s and by the way they weren't bad at least I don't think they were we just replaced them because uh, for maintenance you know just for for future purpose because the 726s have a tendency to get noisy and to uh, fail so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to move on to the tone control section and we're going to redo this board and then we'll give it another test Okay, I just want to show you all something here. We always talk about these orange capacitors. And if you look, this one is a 4.7 microfarad, 50 volt, or is it 25 volt, 25 volt? If we just put it in this little tester, I mean, I'm not even going to get the capacitor analyzer out or anything, but 
you can see it's reading almost double. The ESR is 4 ohms, VLOS is 3.3%. So it's reading bad. Here's another one, 4.7. Again, reading double. It's even worse than the other one. Uh, here's a 2.2 microfarad. You can see it's reading way high. Here's another 4.7. Look how bad that one is. That one's high. And I can go through every single one of those orange capacitors are out of spec. And this is what I'm talking about. You know, the, the last video we did on the 3700, or the 3600, uh, SX3600, all the orange capacitors were good in it. Now, just for comparison, here's, one of, here's a brand new capacitor. And this is one of those uh, UKL series. And it's 4.7 microfarads. And you can see it's right on 4.9 microfarads. Look at the V loss is only 0.7%. ESR is half of the other ones. So that's what these should look like. And again, this is a, a brand new 4.7. So there's my point. And that's the reason I recap these old receivers is that it's, it's a crapshoot. Sometimes um, the caps are all good in them. Sometimes they're not. It's just not worth messing with sometimes. If it's a low-end amp and you're, it's your personal one and you know how to replace the caps if, if and when they go bad and you don't want to do it, that's fine. But this is what I see with these uh, orange low leakage capacitors. I don't know why they fail so much, but they do. Now I could say these other ones here probably you could get away with not replacing them. Very rarely do they go bad. Um, this one's not in the audio path, but it's 35 microfarads at 47, or 47 microfarads at 35 volts, and it's probably going to read good. Let's see if it can detect it. Yep, so it's a little bit low, but it's low ESR. I mean, this is a good cap. It's still good. And if I go through, I'm sure all those other ones are good. It's these orange ones. But while I'm in there, I just do it. I replace them all. I don't mess with it. Um, that's what most customers want. Well, I don't do customers, but I mean what most folks want that, uh, that I do work for. So this has uh, just become my rule. Now, any of you who are regular viewers of this channel will know this already, but I kind of want to go over it with those of you who may not. This, is, this relay was good, by the way. This is out of the protect circuit. And there's a couple of things. Number one, whenever a speaker is connected to the amplifier, it is actually a reactive load. That means it doesn't act like a pure resistor, but rather it acts like a combination of inductance and capacitance. And these things can can cause the voltages when, when they're disconnected to go much higher than they are when the load is connected. So what happens is whenever the protect circuit has to act to protect your speakers from damage, for instance, this little contact has to break all that current. So it's pulled in and your sound is going through here. And when it breaks loose like that, it will actually draw an arc. And it can be a substantial one, and if it does that enough times, it'll cause these little contacts to get pitted. Now, there's several ways to do what we call quench the arc. And on big contactors, on high-powered machinery, it's, it's a completely different thing than this. But on these, there's a couple things. Number one, you could get a double pull or a uh, double throw type switch. In other words, this would be a normally closed, and then the normally open would be down here. And you'd toggle between the two. Notice there's no pins on this one. But what, what you would do is you would connect the speaker terminals together, or to ground, okay, your, your main positive lead of your speaker terminal to ground through this. So when this opens, it actually will short the speaker terminal to the ground terminal. And that will quench that arc very quickly. It's pretty, pretty efficient. <clears throat> Another way to handle it is the way that Pioneer did in this one, and that is to use a special type of relay called bifurcated contacts. 
Now what that is, if you look in here, you have your right and left channel. So in other words, there's two, there's really only two conductors. See there, two, it's two poles, I should say. So you figure your right speaker and your left speaker or whatever. But if you notice, this one is connected to two sets of contacts, a larger set and a smaller set. You see that? And this smaller set, these, these are actually plated with gold. So these are gold plated contacts. These ones are plated with a much higher temperature like tungsten or uh, something like that. It depends on the particular relay, but they're designed to handle a lot more heat and not to arc and pit as much. And the idea is when these come in, these big ones will come in first and they'll handle the arc. You notice those bottom ones, see how there's more give as, as it's seated? So in other words, this one's seated now, this one here is not. But if I go a little further down, you can see then they seat. So these ones actually handle the, the high current load. These gold ones then come in after the arc has been quenched and they make high, really, really good contact. So you kind of get the be best of both worlds. Now that's great when you are, you know, when you're worried about, uh, you know, having low resistance in your contacts. And when the relay has to disengage, it opens and it breaks the circuit on these gold contacts first. And then, this, then the big contacts come out and that's, this is the one that will handle the arc, okay? Now, as you can see though, this does not have a normally closed contact, so it cannot short out uh, the residual energy to ground. And that's normally a good thing because that will greatly reduce the amount of arc you get on this. However, Pioneer took it a step further, and if you look, there's this piece of tape around the outside of the, of the relay. And if you look, there's two things in there. And what those are is they're actually magnets. So you can see they're, they're magnets, okay? And they set up a magnetic field, and that magnetic field will actually quench that arc. So it's a really ingenious little design. And if you notice, as old as this receiver is, this is you know late 1970s technology, these relay contacts are perfect. Now they had a tiny little bit of tarnish on them, uh, as you would uh, expect at this age, but it was very easy to clean. So why am I saying all this? Well, a lot of people by force of habit will just replace the relay because they're told that causes problems with sound quality and so forth. But they replace it with a standard relay. And the relay that you're replacing it with does not have the bifurcated contacts it does not have the quenching magnets. It's a different type of relay, and believe it or not, it's not as good as this original one. So unless this one were actually damaged, I would not replace it. And if I did replace it, I would want to make sure that I modified the board a little bit so that it could short out the, the terminals uh, on the normally closed contacts when it releases. That is provided <laughs> that it's not a, uh, an amplif a bridgeable amplifier, just a standard one that has a common ground between the right and left channels. That's the only ones you could do that with. But anyway, unless you do the wiring even, you know, a little more complicated. So anyway, that's the information about these relays and it's a pretty important thing. I'm finishing up uh, re just doing the service on the amplifier boards for the power amp and I noticed and you, I noticed something that might be interesting to you guys so I thought I'd bring this up if you look at the input this is the input where the signal comes into the power amp and if you notice there are two capacitors in series and they're 2.2 microfarad and if you notice they have the negatives together and the positives are on the outside now there's a couple reasons why I think they did this. First of all, by putting them in this configuration, when you put two 
two, capac two uh, electrolytic capacitors in series like this, it changes them from a polarized capacitor into a non-polarized capacitor. So this is now a non-polarized capacitor. In addition, whatever the capacity is of the two caps, it would cut in half. So if you have these 2.2 microfarads in series, that would make this equal to a 1 microfarad non-polarized capacitor. Now, you might ask yourself, why did they do this when they could just put, for instance, a film capacitor in there or a non-polarized capacitor in there? Well, if you look, they used these orange low leakage caps once again. Now, these are low leakage, but leakage is not the same as ESR. So even though these have very low leakage, they still have ESR. And if I just throw one of these little testers on here, this is not the greatest test on earth, but it'll give us an idea. I don't even know if these caps are good or not. doesn't matter. But you can see, that, yeah, this, this cap's not bad, but the ESR on this is about 2.4 ohms. And a brand new capacitor is probably going to be about the same, I would imagine. It'll be a little bit lower. You could, actually, this one's a little bit higher. So these orange caps on this one are, are good. And if you remember from the, the earlier one, all of the orange ones on the other board were bad. So why would we put these this way and not just use a film cap? Now, a lot of people would say, well, this amp is old, and back then they didn't have uh, larger film capacitors. Well, they actually did. You could get them, and um, they, were, they were available. I mean, here's some film caps right here, these green ones. If I move the camera up for you, you can see. Here's a couple of them right here, and these are like point these are point ones, so you could they would be larger, but uh, you're talking this whole space in here, so you could easily fit a one, a one microfarad film cap in there. I believe part of the reason for this is when you put these capacitors in series, the ESR adds up on them. So let me show you that. Okay, I've now soldered the negative leads of these caps together, just like they are in the manual, or in, on the circuit board. And if we test it now, you can see the capacitance is cut in half, but the ESR has actually gone up. They added together. So if I just check one cap by itself, just so you remember, whoop, <laughs> if I can do this without the leads falling off, here we go. See the ESR is 1.8 ohms, and when I put these together, three point eight ohms. So it about doubles. Now I believe this is a design thing and it's on purpose. I believe they need that ESR in here, and that helps it uh, to control some of the um, any kind of oscillation or things like that. And I could be wrong. This is all a theory with me. But you have to understand, these folks that built these things really knew what they were doing. And if I get a one microfarad film cap, okay, here we go. This is not, I mean, they weren't this tiny back then, but this is a one microfarad 50 volt cap. You can see it's right just about bang on one microfarad. But look at the ESR, how tiny it is. It's only 0.3 ohms, and that's most likely due to the lead length here uh, that you're seeing. So there's essentially no ESR in this at all. And a, a film capacitor, that's one of the characteristics of a film capacitor. So I could be totally wrong on this, but I believe this was done by design. Uh, the other thing is I don't really believe that this has to pass alternating current. What I mean by that is the 
input signal does not change polarity. In other words, you don't see it cross the, the zero volt line and go negative. It just, the, 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 AC, the waveform stays offset above the zero volt ground. So you really don't, probably don't need a capacitor that is bipolar or non-polarized uh, in this instance. I mean, a lot, there's a lot of circuits out there that use this very same thing and they don't have a non-polar capacitor. So I don't think that's necessary. Again, I believe this is strictly because they want that extra ESR. Um, now, that, there again, the leakage is very low. If you looked at what the V loss on there was, it was very low. So these are low leakage capacitors, but they are not necessarily super low ESR. Let me know your thoughts on that. Well, there she is all put back together. Have it all recapped, cleaned up, all the services done. I have not done any alignments, testing, or calibration at this point. Just did the, finished up the restoration and the repairs as we did. So this is a good stopping point. I think I'm going to post this video as a troubleshooting and repair video. And then when we come back next uh, segment, we'll go ahead and do a whole bunch of tests uh, that really aren't very important to me, but <laughs> we'll do them just to see different types of tests for the amplifier. We'll align it. Of course, you have to do DC offset and, and bias. We'll set that. And then eventually we'll probably do a third part where we'll align the tuner section. And we'll get more involved with this. This is not going to be like our last series where we did minimal and used minimum equipment. We're actually going to use all of our test equipment and so forth. So this turned out really well considering how cruddy it was and that it seemed like it had a lot of problems when we started, but looks pretty good now. So I'm going to leave this right here and get it posted. And as always, I'm going to wish you all peace, joy, happiness, and good health in your lives. I want to thank all my patrons out there. Uh, you guys have been awesome. And I know I, <laughs> I'm probably one of the worst channels on earth for patrons. Uh, I, I don't nearly uh, engage with you guys as much as I'd love to. But I promise as soon as I... Uh, figure this out a little more and get a little more time from work and everything. We'll try to do a few things there as well. But uh, anyway, like I said, I'll always do these kinds of videos for everyone. Um, and, and that's never going to change. And uh, I enjoy hearing from all of you, from all of your comments and, and so forth. So as always, we'll see you again real soon. And I uh, hope you enjoyed this. Bye-bye.